Uh, this morning we are very blessed. Uh, Janet is going to share with us and just invite the Lord to be present with us and bless her as she speaks to us. Janet. Good morning. Um, hope you all had a good night's sleep in that first cup of coffee. You ready to go? Because uh, I just really believe that the Lord has so much for all of us today. Um, I want to begin this morning just sharing my favorite scripture about freedom with you. I believe Matt already um, quoted it in his talk about freedom, but it's from John chapter 8, 34, and it says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I love that scripture because it talks about um, our freedom, but it talks about belonging. You know, we want to be set free from those things that hold us back, those, those bondages in our lives, but we want we want to be set free not only from things, but for something. We want to be set free for that relationship with our Heavenly Father, to know that as sons and daughters, we belong to his family. We're not or orphans, we're not alone in this world. We belong to the family of God, to our Heavenly Father. So this morning, um, my talk is called Ministry to Others, and I just really wanna talk about what an unbound session looks like. So how we will assist you to use the five keys to receive freedom from the influence of evil spirits. So um, there's gonna be an opportunity later for um, some of you, many of you, to receive ministry. And um, I was gonna begin this talk by encouraging you <laughs> to come for ministry, but you know, yesterday I came in uh, during the break uh, as uh, p people were in the lobby signing up for sessions, and um, I'm not sure I need to make that encouragement because <laughs> the lobby was full, and I believe many of you have already signed up. Um, but if the Lord is touching something in your heart this weekend, I do want to encourage you to just go for the freedom that he has for you. And as we were praying this morning, I felt like particularly encouraging the seminarians who are there, who are here. You know, I've prayed with a lot of people who receive feel freedom, they feel really liberated and excited, and they say, oh my gosh, why did I have to wait 40 years for this? So I want to encourage the seminarians, those of you who are younger, don't wait. <laughs> don't wait. But, uh, you know, early on in your formation, receive what the Lord has for you. So uh, this, my talk is intended to give you a picture of what you can expect if you come for ministry this, uh, this week. But it's also will lay a foundation for you to use the five keys in your ministry as a priest or a deacon or a seminarian. We believe that our guidelines, if they're followed in using Unbound, that it's a model for uh, praying for deliverance that's safe, easily understood, and reproducible. So I believe that every time I minister to someone, I'm modeling for them not only, not only how they can receive freedom for themselves, but how they can help a friend to receive freedom as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> We refer to deliverance as freedom from the influence of evil spirits because that signifies 
like an ongoing event, an ongoing process, rather than a single event. You know, sometimes t people talk about deliverance like, um, you know, it's this, it's this one big event that happened in my life once, and, um, you know, I, did, I got some freedom, but I don't ever want to go through that again. <laughs> you know, um, th there's a mentality of it has to be once and done. And the truth is, it's, to, it's a part of our conversion. It's an ongoing process. And um, so I'd like to share a little bit more of my testimony about that ongoing process, because I'm a good example of it. So uh, I shared how at one point I received uh, ministry, and I was set free from fear, and I was also set free and healed of migraine headaches at the time. Well, what happened for me was I walked in that freedom and without any symptoms of migraine headaches for probably about two months. And I was really excited, and I probably told everyone I knew. I gave my testimony about how God had healed me and set me free. And then what happened was, after those two months, I started having some symptoms. And then I had some migraine headaches. And I was feeling really discouraged. I was upset. I think um, I was not only upset about the migraine headaches, but I was upset that, um, you know, somehow maybe I ruined God's reputation. <laughs> you know, I told everybody he healed me, and now I'm not. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so what, but what I did, instead of, you know, just giving in to discouragement and hopelessness, I went to some, uh, this couple that we knew who had more experience with deliverance ministry than we did, and I told them what had happened and that I was feeling really discouraged. And they said to me, you need to stand on the truth of what God did that day, and you need to fight for your freedom. Now, at first I was a little leery because for years I had asked people to pray for me for healing, and they would say things like, they would pray a quick prayer and say, now just believe it and you'll be healed, and that just, never resonated with me. But when this time they said, you know, you need to stand on the truth of what God did for you that day, I remembered. I remembered weeping on the floor and getting up and knowing in my knower that God had touched me and believing that he had healed me. And so what I did was I took their advice. I went home and if I started having a migraine headache, um, what I did, instead of going to bed and turning out the lights and taking some medicine, I would fight. I would ask Neil to pray for me. I would quote scripture about who I was as a child of God and the authority I had in my life. And, um, and I'm not saying I never took another Tylenol or didn't lay down, but I changed my response to what I believed was the enemy uh, doing in my life. And the more that I did that, the fewer symptoms I had until I was free of the migraine headaches again. And I don't know, my, my understanding of that um, is that, you know, the enemy was really trying to rob me of what God had done. And the more I ignored him, and the more I turned my, my eyes upon the Lord, I thought, well, I guess the enemy thought he would go bother someone else, you know. So that's what I mean by an ongoing conversion process. Sometimes we need to fight for our freedom. And then there's another part to my story. Um, about two years after um, I was prayed for, one of my sons came to me and he said, I need to talk to you about our relationship. He said, I feel like you always think that you're right and I'm wrong, and you think you're better than me. And um, 
that really hurt. <laughs> he said he was having a difficulty experiencing my love. So as a mom, I don't, it, that just really hurt. And um, so I asked my son to leave the room, <laughs> and I cried. <laughs> and, um, but instead of responding and staying in that hurt, I wanted to know what the Lord was doing and what he was saying in this relationship difficulty. So I went to Neil and I asked him to uh, minister to me using the five keys. And that day, uh, what came up for me in ministry was some memories from my childhood, uh, memories of um, some rejection from peers, but mostly it was my relationship with my dad. And the memories that came up were uh, of my dad, um, times when he would be angry. I grew up in a family, a large family. I have eight siblings. Four of my siblings are brothers who um, quite frequently um, were in trouble. <laughs> and dad needed to discipline. And sometimes it was in his anger. And the memories that I had was that that was frightening for me. And what the Lord revealed to me th that day is that was the root of my fear. That what I experienced as a child was fear of that anger, fear of conflict, fear of men. I think that maybe the biggest thing was the fear of being out of, a con out of control. You know, when you're um, a child in a situation where there's nothing you can do, you, f you fear or you feel out of control. And so as Neil ministered to me, I renounced those things as, as my enemy, and I was set free of fear at a deeper level. You see, two years before, that man who I found out, I was the first person that he prayed for deliverance for, <laughs> He just named it, and God in his sovereignty used that for me. But now, the Lord wanted to take it to a deeper level and show me the root of the fear. And that's part of the unbound process, is we always want to find that entryway, um, the root, so that we can be set free at a deeper and deeper level. So, deliverance ministry it's just part of our conversion, and it's an ongoing process, and we are not a failure if we don't receive it all in one session. Our objective in Unbound Ministry is that we want to love the person with the love of Jesus Christ and assist them in getting free from the influence of evil spirits. Jesus delivers. We assist. So this model is different from other models that are uh, more confrontational, where there may be more manifestations um, and are more focused on demons and those manifestations and may look more like exorcism. Unbound is non-confrontational deliverance ministry. We focus on the person and their story and listening for those entryways that Neil talked about yesterday. We want to help the person to confront the truth, but we're not interested in confronting spirits. So Unbound looks more like evangelism than it does exorcism. And I think of the difference <laughs> between those two models, confrontational and non-confrontational deliverance, as um, the difference between a doctor delivering a baby and a midwife assisting in natural childbirth. I've had both experiences. And when the doctor delivered my baby, I felt like there was a professional there, and it was his job to uh, get the baby out. <laughs> when a midwife helped deliver my children, I felt like I had a friend. I had someone who came alongside of me and coached me and assisted me and cheered me on. Well, for me, that's a picture of what we want to be 
as we assist people to receive freedom from the influence of evil spirits. We want to be a coach, an assistant. We want to come alongside of them and help them to receive freedom. Sometimes people come and they're focused on their suffering. Some of you have come here because of the suffering in your life. And we want to listen to you and we want to respond in compassion. But our focus is on helping you to understand how have you responded to the suffering in your life. Because when it comes to either bondage or freedom for us, it's, it isn't the suffering as much as how did we respond to that suffering when it comes to our freedom. So we're always going to have the cross in our lives, but we don't need to live without hope or joy. So if you come for ministry this afternoon, um, there will be a team to minister to you. And I want to share a few principles about what it means to be uh, on an Unbound ministry team. Some of you are going to be actually be on the team. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> when we asked you to sign up in twos, so one of you will be ministered to and you were asked to sign up to bring a brother with you. That brother is there to be an intercessor for you. So our team usually consists of um, a leader and one or two uh, intercessors. When it comes to the ministry time where you will, uh, the leader will do um, a short interview and then lead you uh, through those five keys. On our teams, there's always one leader, one person that interacts with the person receiving ministry. And we have, there's two reasons for that. One is the person who's ministering, the leader, wants to make a heart-to-heart -heart connection with the person that they're ministering to. And if, uh, you know, it's more of a team approach and you are focusing on several people in the room, it can be hard for that connection to be made. The other reason is that evil spirits respond to the authority of Jesus Christ being manifest in a person. And so we want it to be clear in that session where that authority lies. Another guideline on our teams is that there would always be a woman on a team if a woman is being ministered to, and the same thing for men. Um, that um, it doesn't need to be a man that's, that would lead your session, say, this afternoon, but there would need to be a man on the team. It wouldn't be two women leading that session. Again, another reason for your bringing a brother with you. That is just to ensure comfort, reassurance, and protection. We always want people to feel comfortable and safe when they're receiving ministry. Another principle on our team is that confidentiality is of the utmost importance. People have told us, I've never shared this with anyone before in my life. <laughs> people come feeling vulnerable, and they really need to know that what they share in their, that session would never be shared outside of that session without their permission. Confidentiality is important. So uh, we've been talking these past few days about the five keys, um, the five keys that we use to minister, the repentance and faith, forgiveness, renunciation, authority, and the Father's blessing. So I just want to give you a picture now and talk about the process of how we use those five keys in a se session. So the first thing when you come, perhaps this afternoon, is we just want you to feel comfortable. And so the team will do everything they can um, to be in a pretty private space. We've done the best we can with, with what's av available here. Um, 
And we just want to welcome you warmly and help you um, to just feel comfortable enough to share your story. And um, the, the leader is going to do a short interview. And with your permission, we'll be taking a few notes. And we do that because it's just, it's helpful if we can jot things down as you're sharing, then when it comes to time for ministry, it's all right there. So the first thing about that interview is that you will be asked a question. And, uh, and for this time here, the question will probably be what is coming up in your heart as you've been listening, as you've been doing practice with forgiveness and renunciation, what's been coming up for you? What area of your life do you feel stuck where you want the Lord to bring freedom to you? And then after you um, begin to share that, our job, the job of the team is to listen, to listen through the lens of those five keys. So we're listening for who do you need to forgive and what are the words that you're using that are your enemies that you need to renounce. So for example, let's say a woman comes in for a session and, the, and is asked that question, you know, what's your struggle today? And she says, I think it's my relationship with my sister. I really resent her. When we were growing up, she used to torture me and tease me. She called me fat and ugly. Well, if I'm leading that session on my paper, I would have written, it sounds like she needs to forgive her sister, right? And she used the word resentment, so I would have written that down. And also, if someone struggles with resentment, Many times along with that comes anger, some t uh, bitterness, sometimes hatred, sometimes revenge or retaliation, and can even lead to a spirit of murder. And so as I'm listening, I might have written down a few of those related sp spirits so that I can ask her about them later on. In a session, at some point, the leader will usually ask a question, what was your relationship like with your mom and your dad when you were growing up? And the reason for that is if we uh, can get a picture of how did you respond early in life to those most significant relationships, what was your response to the traumas or, or to the difficulties in relationship when you were a child, and you've shared what your struggle is now, many times what we can see is this pattern of a response that you're still, that's still going on in your life. And that is a, is a real key to the enemy's entryway. This is how you were responding then, and that pattern is continuing in your relationships now, and it's something that the enemy has taken hold of. The leader will also want to know about support in your life. You know, do you have a good brother in the Lord or group of brothers in the Lord where you're really able to share your, your life um, deeply and receive support. You know, many times uh, people will come, I shouldn't say many times, but sometimes people will come and as, as we ask that question about what, what their relationships are like, um, you know, even do you have a, a close relationship with a mature Christian friend, sometimes there's people who, you know, They've, they've gone to this church and then to that church because they've not found a, a home and they don't have a good supportive relationship in their own family. Um, they just seem to be alone. <laughs> um, we really want to know about that because just like my testimony, People need that support afterwards. You need the support of someone else who understands so that if you're struggling, 
you have someone to go to and they can help you to continue to walk in that freedom. So we want to know that there is support in the person's life. So what are the questions that you might be asked in the interview? People will ask me sometimes, well, what questions are they going to ask me? We really uh, want to let the Holy Spirit lead us. Questions about parents, siblings, and childhood trauma are important because those are all, can be, entryways, as well as uh, sexual relationships outside marriage, they can be entryways as well. The leader would also be listening for um, a cult practice. Are there obstacles due to curses, spells, magic? And a curse can be found in negative words spoken over us by oneself or Many times it's by those who are closest to us. Words like, you are a mistake. We never meant to have you. You'll never amount to anything. Those are curses that have been spoken over people. Involvement in the occult is like sealing Satan's plan. It's like whatever else has gone on, that occult in involvement sort of cements it or seals that plan for someone's life. It's like an invitation has been made to him to come in and now we want to take that invitation back. The leader might also ask some questions about your relationship with the Lord, listening for um, your relationship with the Father and the Son you know, sometimes people come and, and they'll say to me, um, well, I love Jesus. I have a really close relationship with him, but I just don't know about the Father, you know, because so many people have been wounded by their own fathers. So we're, we're listening for that. And the last area would be that we would be listening for is repentance for significant sins brought up in the interview that have not been repented of. So sometimes as you're listening to a, someone's story, they may ha have confessed, um, but as you're listening, it sounds more like they've excused and they've blamed someone else. It's, a, it's always because of someone else. So if that comes up uh, in the interview, if it comes up and that sense of they haven't really repented, we wanna note that and help them with that first key. This is an opportunity for you to take responsibility for your, for your responses through forgiveness and renunciation, overcoming any temptation to blame others or to see yourself as a victim. So to finish the interview, we would summarize what you've shared and share any insights into the entryways. So I would, I would you know, look at my notes and speak back to you speak back to the person that I'm ministering to, you know, this is what I saw. These are the people that you mentioned that it, uh, it, it would be good for you to forgive today. Do you want to do that? So we're speaking back uh, the, uh, for, from the notes that we've taken. We're speaking back what they've shared and getting permission. This is their time. They're taking or you're taking authority in your life. We're just standing with you in it, so we want to get your permission for how we're going to proceed. So, for example, like that, that woman who came and um, that I used as an example and uh, resented her sister, I would ask her, do you want to forgive your sister today? And, you know, you said you resented her. Do you struggle with bitterness and... Um, 
Do you struggle with anger? Have you ever had thoughts of, of hatred towards your sister? And if she responded yes to those things, I would check them off as her enemies to renounce. So um, after listening to the story um, and then responding, giving a response to the person about this is how we'd like to proceed, we're ready to lead you in making pronouncements with the five keys. So first we would lead in a prayer of repentance for any sins acknowledged in the interview and that prayer of surrender. Um, you know that Neil already talked about when he talked about the first key. So to, just to lead the person to simply say, um, Lord, I come to you today and I thank you that you died on the cross for me. And I thank you that you have forgiven me for all of my sins. And once again today, Lord, I just surrender my heart to you because I want you to be Lord of everything in my life. And please forgive me, Lord, for blaming you for the, for the things that have happened in my life. I want you to be Lord of everything. And then we would lead in pronouncing forgiveness. One of the benefits of leading the person and having them um, just repeat after us is that we can help you to be specific and go to that place of pain. So if, if I've listened to your story, I've heard the story, when it comes to forgiving, I can help you to be specific and say, I forgive my dad for not being there at my games. I forgive my dad for, uh, for not blessing me as his son. I forgive my dad for not ever telling me how much he loved me. I forgive my dad in the name of Jesus. So it releases forgiveness at a deeper level if we can forgive from that place of pain, from that place uh, where we've been wounded. Uh, after uh, for the forgiveness, we want to lead in renouncing each area of bondage, just as you did uh, yesterday with Neil. Renounce means to withdraw from engagement, commitment, agreement, or covenant with the enemy, whether it's physical, mental, or spiritual. We identify with Jesus and his authority and say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce anger. In the name of Jesus, I renounce resentment. Demons respond to Jesus. So all of the areas uh, that for renunciation, all of those areas that apply to your story would be covered in renunciation. And then the leader will place his hand on your head with your permission and uh, speak the command. It doesn't need to be loud. We don't need to shout. <laughs> but it should be said firmly with authority. In the name of Jesus, I command every spirit that Father Joe has renounced, and I command them to leave him right now. And we will wait just a few seconds. Just wait. And then ask this question of you. What is coming to your mind right now? And that's an important question for the leader because what you respond to that question is going to help them to know how to continue to minister to you. So sometimes people will say, um, nothing's coming to my mind. I don't think anything happened. I don't think I'll ever be free. Well, then what the leader would do is have you renounce doubt and unbelief because that's what's coming against you right now. And many times, once that has been done, then the person will, will feel free. 
Sometimes um, what, will, what will come to someone's mind may seem totally out of context of that ministry session, and they'll say, um, oh, I don't understand it, but my grandfather is coming to my mind now. In that case, what we want to do is go back to the interview, ask a few questions about grandfather, and take them through the, the five keys again. What's happened usually is that when that command is given the first time, some more superficial things have, been, have come up and have been taken care of. Now the deeper issue is coming up. And we just want to go through the keys again, give the command again, and ask that question again. We are always looking for your response. It's your testimony of what God's done, whether you're, you've received freedom or not. We don't want to tell anybody that they're free. I remember one time, uh, Neil and I were ministering to someone. Neil was the leader, and I was uh, interceding for him, and I remember after giving the command, he said to uh, the woman that he was ministering to, he said, what's coming to your mind? And she said, I see fireworks. And Neil said, well, what do they look like? And she said, oh, they're all different colors. They're going off all over the place. It's really beautiful. And he said, yes, it's your Independence Day. But you notice he asked her, what do they look like? You know, for some people, fireworks are frightening or too loud or they're not a good experience. But when she said, they're beautiful, they're going off all, all over the place, he was confirming, yes, it's your Independence Day. It was her testimony. It was her uh, expression of, yeah, I, I, I'm seeing freedom. Sometimes, and not everybody sees fireworks. <laughs> uh, sometimes people will just say, I feel good, I feel peaceful. And, that, and the leader just might not be sure, does that mean freedom or, or not? You know, or is there more to do here? Is there something um, else deeper? What we will um, have you do is give thanksgiving. Thanksgiving reveals the heart, and it seals what's been renounced and commanded. So if I can lead the person to say, thank you, Lord, that I forgave my sister today. Thank you, Lord, that, uh, that I forgave my mom and my dad. And Lord, I thank you that I'm not an orphan. I belong to you. I belong to your family. If someone can freely give thanksgiving and make pronouncements of the truth in the areas where there have been lies, it's a pretty good indication that they've received freedom. Well, what if, um, you know, we've gone through a session a couple of times, gone through, you know, um, the five keys several times because more has come up and the, the person doesn't seem fully free, they seem somewhat still conflicted and yet the team has prayed for, ministered to everything that, they, that the Lord has brought up to that day, everything they have wisdom for or they're running out of time. What, how do we end a session like that. Well, we always want to end by giving thanks for what God has done. Even if the, the person hasn't fully been set free, we can thank God for what he has done. To lead them to say, thank you, Lord, that I've forgiven today. And I thank you, Lord, um, that uh, I can walk in the freedom that you have brought in my life. And thank you, Lord, that, uh, that I am your child. 
We want to encourage the person. Thank the Lord for what they have done. Give thanksgiving that, that even if there's more to do, they've learned how to use those five keys for themselves. You know, our goal is always that people would go away knowing that these are tools that they can use for their own lives. You don't always need to come back to the expert for more. But we can also encourage that if you, you know, go home, maybe you need some more time to process. Uh, go home and read Unbound a little bit more. You can get together with a friend who understands the keys and go through them together. Or you can come back for another session. So we give thanksgiving for what God has done and give encouragement for expectation for more, for more freedom, more deliverance. The goal is that you would go away feeling loved and cared for. We always tell our teams that deliverance, your freedom, your deliverance is in the hands of Jesus. Our goal as, as ministers is that you would experience love and compassion. The last key is the Father's blessing. So, um, you know, at this point, um, the person has really been, you know, emptied out of all this stuff, and we want to fill them up. And so, uh, we'll ask you uh, to stand, to stand before the Father and receive the blessing that he has for you. You know, because as I said before, you know, we, we want to be set free from things, but it's for something. It's that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And you know that this key, the Father's blessing for many people, is the most important. And for many people is, is the, the most freeing. And so the team is going to pray for you to be filled up in all those places that have been emptied out. Pray for the Holy Spirit to come and just to fill you. And then what we want to do is to bless you, is to speak a word from the Father that would bless you. And I always like to um, encourage those who are praying for the Father's blessing um, to really ask the Father for something specific to bless his child, to bless you if you've come from ministry. And so, for example, if I'm praying for a woman, I want to pray something specific for her as a woman. I want to bless her as a mother, as a wife. I want to bless her femininity. I want to bless her ability to nurture and to give life. If I'm praying for a man, I want to bless him to know that he has what it takes to fulfill God's plan for him as a man of God. Sometimes special words, prophetic words, can be given as a, a, a blessing. And I... Um, I've, I have such a heart to want to see people receive the Father's blessing that I've asked them, Lord, would you please give me something specifically to bless this person today? And if you've ever received a, a blessing like that, something that came from the Father's heart, um, it can transform your life. And if you've ever received that, you know what a precious gift it is. Uh, one time, I was praying with a woman. She was um, older than me. This was several years ago, maybe, maybe my age. <laughs> she was my age at the time, or a little bit older. Anyway, 
this, in this session, she had shared the biggest relationship that she really had difficulty with growing up was her mom. And she, so much so that she shared that as a teenager, she had really cut her heart off from her mom uh, and withdrew her heart from her mom. She experienced, she shared experiencing a lot of abandonment as a child and she, like she shared this one picture of how um, she was left in the hospital and at that time in the country she was in years ago, parents were not allowed to visit and her mom would come to see her and she could only look through this tiny little window um, into the room where her, her child was. And so she had these memories of being abandoned which led her, her response in life uh, was at one point was, um, you know, to be angry towards her mom, upset with her mom, and to cut herself off from her mom. So it came to, um, she received a lot of freedom, did a lot of forgiveness, and it came time for the Father's blessing. And when I placed my hand on her head, and I always take a moment and say, Lord, what do you want to say to your daughter? And a picture came to my mind. And so I spoke the picture to her and I said, I see your heart. It's really big. And I, as I spoke those words, then I saw a flower in the middle of her heart. And I said, I see a flower and it's an iris. Now, in the back of my mind is like, is that because I really like irises, <laughs> you know? But I spoke what I felt like the Lord gave me. And I just spoke out of that picture and I said, you know, it's a beautiful flower, it's in the middle of your heart. And the, and the Lord just loves looking at your heart because it's so beautiful. And the Father declares, you are my precious, beloved daughter. I love to look at your heart. When I finished praying that blessing, she looked up at me and she said, my mother's name, was Iris. Yeah, that was, that was my response. I was like, whoa. Here, the, the biggest relationship that was such a difficulty for her that had led to her withdrawing her heart was her mom. And here's the Lord giving me a picture that represented her mom back in the middle of her heart. Now, can anybody <laughs> but God the Father do something like that? To say to, to someone, do you see, do you see how I know you? Do you see how much my heart is for you and I want to bless you? So I always, I always like to encourage people, everyone, you know, you may not have a desire to pray for deliverance for people, but you know what? We all need to be blessed. <laughs> None of us has received the blessing completely that God the Father intended for us. Some of you may have had wonderful parents that did a good job of blessing you, but no one has received to the fullest extent the blessing that God the Father has in his heart for them. But you know what? We can catch up. We can catch up by blessing one another. I encourage moms and dads to speak blessing over your children. Find occasions and reasons to place your hands on your child and to bless them. Bless the, who they are. We wanna bless people in their identity and their destiny. Who they are as a child of God and the plan that God has for their lives, because that's where the enemy has robbed us. So we want to speak blessing. I'll tell uh, one more example um, of, of blessing that uh, is just precious to me that I that I share a lot. There was um, a woman that I ministered to at a conference, and um, she uh, 
she received, I knew she received in her session a lot of freedom because there was a lot of tears and, and, and uh, really deep things and the Lord, you know, in his graciousness had brought freedom. And then it was time for the blessing and um, I saw a picture for her as well as I placed my hand on her head. I saw a picture of her and she was a little girl about um, five years old and um, she was dressed as a princess. She had on a really cute little dress and she had a tiara on her head. And, and so that's the picture I had from the father. So I prayed into it and I, I just declared, you're a daughter of the King of Kings. You're his child. You're his princess. And so I blessed her as a princess, a daughter of the king. And I didn't know how she felt about that blessing, and, but she came back to me um, later that day, and she said, I just want to tell you what that blessing meant for me. She said, when I was a little girl, my mom and dad used to call me their princess. That's who I was at home. And then she went to school, uh, went to kindergarten, and she came home from school the first day, and she was in tears. And her mom met her at the front door and asked her what was wrong. And she said, Mom, you won't believe it. I told all the kids at school today that I'm a princess, and they didn't believe me. Well, she had a really good mom. And her mom said, you know, I, w I want you to know, at home here, you are our princess. You'll always be our princess. But the truth is, out in the world, you're not a princess. <laughs> but again, what, what the Lord did is, uh, what she said to me that day is, you know, only God the Father could have known how much that meant to me, that, that, you know, that the Lord would give me a picture of something that deeply hurt her as a child, but that he used to speak healing um, over her now and blessing um, as a grown woman. So if we can do that, uh, it doesn't, it's, it's not always a picture. It might be a scripture that comes to mind that we, as we're blessing that person, the scripture comes to mind and we bless them by speaking that scripture over them. And, I've, and, you know, people have said to some of our team members, that's my favorite scripture. And, uh, yeah, I remember one time praying with um, a sister, a religious sister, and I started describing her in this garden and... Um, and as I described the garden and the Father's love for her and the blessing, and after it was all over, she told me that how much Song of Songs meant to her and that the description of the garden um, for her was something that the Lord had used when she was discerning her vocation. So those are... Those are some of the, my stories of how the Father has broken in just because um, he wanted to bless that person who has come and emptied themselves out and received freedom from the influence of evil spirits and now is open and ready to receive the blessing that God the Father has for them. So I just want to encourage you um, in whatever way the Lord leads you to bless others, to, to do that, to just speak blessing, because as I said before, it can change a light. So to finish a session, um, we like to do a little bit of uh, a follow-up in terms of just having you sit down once again after the Father's blessing, just see how you're doing, um, see how you're feeling, and just encourage you, you know, these are the, the 
significant enemies that you renounce today, you know, um, maybe it'd be good to journal <laughs> your experience of today and to write that down so that you, you have written down somewhere your experience of freedom, who your enemies are, the most significant things, so that in that ongoing um, battle, if there is temptation or if there is that battle to hold on to your freedom, that you have a place where you can look back and say, oh yeah, you know, I'm struggling with that again and that's my enemy. I, I was set free from that. And, you know, many times then it's just a matter of saying, of renouncing it or even of just recognizing it and saying, that's, where, that's the way the enemy wants me to respond in this situation, and I won't. <laughs> I'm taking back that territory. Romans chapter 6, verse 22, I'd like to just conclude with. It says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. You've been set free from sin, and now we are no longer slaves to sin, to the enemy, but we are slaves to God. And the benefit that we reap is holiness and eternal life. Amen.